had to uh, take a one dead bandana and soak it down. Wrap it around her head and put a straw hat on over it yeah. so that it would, you know, protect him. And See, that's what I had. I had. And he stroke. Thank you. 
Sunday's about time to get started. It's good to see everybody in church today. If you're glad you're in church, let's give the Lord a big amen. Ready? Amen. We're glad to hear too. Let's all stand together. We'll sing a couple of songs. Dad's going to lead us and Richard's going to play. This one is called Peace Like a River. It's on 418. 418. And we got a good house today. Build up. So we ought to be able to get in touch with the Lord. Amen. Amen. 418.
Jamie? Everything goes well on that procedure, and she gets some relief. She's really been through it, Shirley. Sure. Our prayers with you and Jerry both. Uh, okay, Shirley. What's his name? see you back. I'm glad you got your knee fixed. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you're doing well. Thank you. Come walking in. Look, you would never know. She just had a knee replacement a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we're glad the Lord's blessed you in a special way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Anybody else have one you want to mention? Jerry? Just uh, remember our children, okay. grandchildren, they all need
prayers are with you and her. I always pray for you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I still probably pray for our neighbors know they uh, brought her home with hospice and just kind of waiting. Oh. Yeah. For a few days. And just for a few weeks or so. Well, I'm putting that back in Christ's hands. Yes. Sir. In the Lord's hands, that's for sure. Uh, uh, and Karen, I'm sure, said, you know, it's hard on her. She's our neighbor. Keep them in prayer. Anybody else about unspoken today? A lot of unspoken requests. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and remember these. And uh, Jerry, won't you lead us as we start? Father, thank you for just another opportunity to be in your house today. Lord, Amen. Lord let us apply this message we're about to receive to our hearts and our minds and use it in our everyday life, Lord, as we go out. taking a group from the church over to Tanglewood and I believe we moved it to the 16th is that right? Yes sir, we moved it to the 16th we were able to get to Haybriar um, on the 16th to go to the right um, we'll meet here at the Rick Museum and I'm really afraid we're going to go to Chick-fil-A and have dinner before we go because we've got to go to the barn but we were going to meet at the back
sure does a good job with all these extra activities and I enjoy it. Randy does a good job driving. We have a great time together. And uh, so I hope you can go on some of these trips, enjoy them, be with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and just have a good time. Okay, I believe we're going to go to birthdays. Anybody with a birthday coming up this week? Anybody with a birthday? No birthdays? How about anniversaries? Anybody with an anniversary? All right. If not, men, if y'all come to the front, we'll go ahead and receive our offering today. While they're coming, how many made a contact this week? You invited somebody to come to church with you. One, two, three. Okay. Start inviting people. You never know when they're going to come. And the uh, Lord bless you for them. Donald, you lead us if you will. Lord, come to you this morning and thank you for all you have blessed us. Pray that you be with this service. Lord, right now I pray that you be with this office. Amen. And bless it to the rest of everybody. And Lord, may you continue to use us. Help us to do the best we can, Lord. Yeah. All that you do, we thank you and praise you. Watch over us. We need God grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to do two offerings today. The first one's our regular tithes and offering. Uh, the second offering is going to go to help Brother Harold Noble. We're trying to get some uh, benches for him or some uh, chairs. They've got a church over there, I think, in the Philippines, and they don't have enough chairs for all the people. So if you want to give anything towards that offering, that'll be the second offering. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, I just want to say, I know uh, Brother Harold is a
Everybody knows this one. We got this one covered. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Cut off this time. Thank 
tears that swam down his face. There weren't two shoes, a prayer, and a sinner saved by grace. There weren't two shoes, a prayer, and a sinner saved by grace. chapter today, and uh, Wanda, could you turn this one up just a tad more? Just, all right, that's good, thank you. All right, John chapter 7, Jesus is still working and teaching in the celebration called the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's when the Jewish people would get together in October after the harvest, and they would fix tents, they would sleep in those tents, for one week, and they would have teaching and preaching, and they would have festivities and all the celebrations that most of the holidays would have. You had three big feasts that everyone was required to go to Jerusalem three times a year. Number one is the Feast of Tabernacles, or Booths, the one we're talking about here. Then there was the uh, Feast of Pentecost, and then the Passover. All three of them, the males had to go to Jerusalem and take their family with them and worship there in Jerusalem. But uh, Jesus is right here in this passage giving us some truths and one of the truths is that there will be certain people that's going to be kept out of heaven. They'll be kept out of heaven and the reason for that is because they will not believe in Jesus Christ. Now the Bible said any man be in Christ he's a new creature, creation. Old things pass away. All things become new. So when we come to Christ, he saves us. There's a lot of people that will not do that. And these Pharisees, he tells them, they're trying to kill him and they're trying to plot against him. And he says, where I go, you cannot come. In other words, he's going to shut the door to them to go to heaven. They won't be able to come there. So we're in John chapter 7 and verse number 26. It says, but lo, he speaketh boldly, and they saw nothing, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye have both known me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come to myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him, and I am from him, and he hath sent me. Isn't that a blessing? Yes. He says, I know who sent me. I'm here to do my Father's will, and no man's going to stop me. And remember, they were plotting against him, saying if he shows up at the Feast of Tabernacles, then they're going to kill him. But no man laid the hands on him. It's amazing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll get right into our passage today. Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to know the privilege to be back here at Grace Baptist Church, a warm, loving church. And we thank you for every person here today. Teach us things from your word that will help us to be more like Jesus. And I pray that God, if there be one here that's never made that most important decision, they'll do so. That's what Jesus wants. He wants to save everyone that would believe in him. And so we pray that that would be a possibility if there be one here that needs to be saved. And we'll thank you for it. Fill us with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Heard about two guys working for the city and one of them would dig a hole and he would dig, dig, dig and the other one would come in behind him and fill the hole. And he'd fill, fill, fill right back up. One dug a hole, one filled the hole. One dug the hole, one come in behind him and filled, uh, filled the hole. And so they did this time and time again. There's a man over there on the sidewalk watching, and he couldn't believe how hard the men were working, but he couldn't understand, why are you digging holes and then filling in the holes after you dig them? And so he said to the hole digger, 
hey, I appreciate how hard you're working, but what are you doing? You dig a hole and your partner comes in behind you and fills it up again. And the hole digger said, oh yeah, must look funny, but the guy who plants the trees is sick today. <laughs> so we're going to go on without him. <laughs> and no trees. <laughs> Anyway, you ever seen sometimes uh, about 20 people are out talking and one's down in a hole working and, and uh, you wonder what's going on. Yes, yes. But anyway, back in John chapter 7, Jesus makes a stern, powerful warning. The Pharisees are so jealous of him, they're plotting his death, and he's going to challenge them and remark that they can never go to heaven because of their unbelief in him. He makes it plain. There's no way to go to heaven except through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And these Pharisees are religious people, but they were not believers in our Lord. They could be condemned for all eternity because of their unbelief. And the same is true today. If a person refuses to trust Christ as Savior and Lord, that person cannot go to heaven. And with that in mind, let's see how Jesus handles both the believers and the unbelievers in this passage. This is just an ordinary day in the life of the Lord. He comes down about the middle of the week. They're all wondering, is he going to show up? And then there were some people saying, if he shows up, we're going to grab him and kill him. But they couldn't do it when he showed up. Now, we see in verse 26, But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Now, Jesus is preaching and teaching the word of God boldly right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. And they don't know what to do. No one told him to stop. No one questioned him. No one tried to quieten him down. Why is that? I'll tell you why it is. Because he was a powerful man who had cleaned out that temple about two years before this ever happened. And he would clean it out again right before he goes to the cross. And so this is just one day in the life of Jesus. It's in October and he is not only going to go to the cross in about six months from this, he'll go to the cross the next April, but he's making it very clear who he is, why he has come to planet Earth. Now, he's the Savior of all mankind, and he will save you if you'll put your faith and trust in him. The average person in the crowd is wondering why the rulers have not tried to stop him. But they can't stop him. It wasn't the right time. And he has all the people that need to hear the gospel that he needs to get the gospel to, so he can't allow them to take him at this time. Verse number 27. Howbeit we know this man, whence he is. But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Now there was a popular idea associated with the coming of the Messiah, and that was that he would be a man of mystery, coming out of nowhere. Jesus was known to have come from Nazareth. And so they said, well, he's not a man of mystery. We know his background, so he doesn't fit the qualifications. And there was this mythical rumor that when Messiah came, he'd make a grand entrance into the world in a blaze of glory. But friends, Jesus was born in a little village called Bethlehem. And he was anything but grand at his birth. He was not born in a castle. He was born in a little stable among the little animals that stayed there. Why is that? Why didn't he be born in a big castle somewhere? Because he was the Lamb of God. And lambs are not born in castles. They're born in stables. And so try to rationalize there, trying to rationalize Jesus away by saying, I know his background. I know who his human parents were, Mary and Joseph. I know he's from Nazareth. And so, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, they ask? And of course, the answer to that is yes. Jesus came out of Nazareth, so did Jonah. They make the claim, no prophet comes from Nazareth, and yet we know there were several of them that came out of Nazareth. And so, verse number 28, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both, you both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. Now, Jesus cried out, which means he shouted with the top of his lungs. There's only one other word in the Greek language for cry out that's stronger than this one, and that is when he was on the cross. The Bible said he cried out, it 
is finished. And thank God the great transaction was completed and our Savior Jesus resurrected three days later and ascended back to heaven 40, 40 days later or 50 days later. And thank God he is in heaven today. He is praying for you and he is praying for me. Amen. And so Bethlehem was anything but grand. And yet they didn't even know and had not even done enough homework to realize this man does fit the criteria. He was born in Bethlehem. And so he says there, you both know me and you know whence I am. I'm not come of myself in verse 28, but he that sent me, he's true. So he's crying out. He's shouting to the top of his voice. Now what is he shouting? He's saying that they really do not know him because they have not studied his background enough to even know that he was born not in Nazareth, but down in Bethlehem. And so he came to do his heavenly father's work. And in order to know the father, you had to be saved. And in order to know Jesus, you had to know the father. Christ says, in effect, if you knew God, you would recognize who I am because I and my father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Then he says in verse 29, But I know him, and he did. He knew his Father. I am from him, and he has sent me. Jesus knows the Father, and in fact, he claimed that if you had, not, that if you had seen him, of course you had seen the Father with him, because they were one, and you had God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity of God, Three gods into one God. Three persons into one God. They split it up. They were all equal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so he says in verse 29, But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Jesus knows the Father. And in fact, he claimed that if you had seen him, you have seen the Father. But the crowd is so illiterate when it came to knowing the Heavenly Father that they didn't even recognize this man is from heaven. This man is the Messiah. Verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. That's the answer to why they didn't take him. They were making threats like we're going to kill him if he shows up. And then when he showed up, they didn't touch him. Why? Because they knew he spoke differently. They knew he was a powerful man. They knew they better not touch him. The Jewish leadership decided to grab him they couldn't do it because it was not time for Jesus to die yet. They would not be able to do this until six months later at the Passover. So this reveals the reason why they did not seize him. God's sovereign timetable and plan would not allow them to touch Jesus before the time was right. God had it worked out. It didn't catch God off guard when they came and arrested Jesus. He was going to allow them to do that to him. Verse 31. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? Well, you get the idea here. There's many people starting to believe on Jesus and his claims. And that infuriated the Jewish leaders. They're upset. They're mad. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all the sad boys, they're, they're upset. Why? Because everybody started following Jesus. Everybody stopped following them. They didn't like it. It hit them in the pocketbook. And the believer's reason is that when Christ comes back, that he would never be able to do more miracles than this man's done. When you look at him, you see a man who's done all kinds of miracles. That's why they said, when Christ cometh, will he do more than these, than this man has already done? No way. Jesus is the Christ. Divided conviction existed among the people regarding Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, a small remnant of genuine believers existed among the crowd and they believed in him. But the question here anticipates a negative answer. The Messiah could do no greater work than what Jesus had done because Jesus was the Messiah. And so we see in verse number 32, the Pharisees heard the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Now they get the army involved. The, the uh, temple soldiers. And they say, men, you need to go arrest this guy. And boy, they are so infuriated and they're upset. They send the army officers in to capture Jesus, but they cannot touch him. He's too strong for that. 
They hear that stout warning that Jesus gives. And no man laid a hand on him. Our Lord answered the Pharisees, that, Hey, you can take me, but only at the proper time. It'll be six months later, not now. Then he tells them he's going to leave them. He's speaking of his resurrection and his ascension. And that they would never be able to see him again. Never be able to touch him again. Have you noticed that after the cross of Jesus Christ, none but loving hands ever touched him after that? And none but loving eyes ever saw him after he rose from the dead. He didn't appear to the Pharisees anymore. He didn't appear to those unbelievers anymore. It was too late. They had the opportunity. They had the chance right here to be saved, but they would not do it. Then in verse 33, Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. He's predicting that he will die, be buried, and rise from the dead, and that he would ascend back to heaven six months later, and he would be gone, and they would not be able to find him. And that's why we have the title, They Would Be Kept Out of Heaven. They won't be able to come. Notice the faith of the unsaved. Here's what he says. Verse 34. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither you cannot come. They would come seeking Jesus, but they would not be able to find Jesus because he has already ascended to his Father in heaven. The only way to go to heaven is by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. They would not do that. And this could be said of many people today. They think God is too good to send anybody to hell. But friends, it's not God who sends anybody to hell. It's that person who refuses Christ who sends themselves to hell. Amen. He's made the offer. He's made the sacrifice. He's done everything he can do, but he won't force himself. He wants us to willingly come and follow him. So there will be people who reject Christ, thinking they're going to go to heaven, and they'll only end up in eternity with condemnation and hell fire. I heard about Mistress Fletcher. She went to the butcher. And you know, it always pays to be honest. And Jesus was always honest, and that's why he told them the truth. He said, you're going to seek me, but you cannot find me. So Miss Fletcher goes to the butcher shop to get her a chicken for Sunday meal, and the butcher has only one scrawny chicken left. He puts it on the scales. He said, three pounds. She said, no, that's too scrawny. Don't you have something bigger? And so he pretends to rummage around back there, and he puts the same chicken back on the scale, and he pressed it down with his thumb. He said, oh, this is three and a half pounds. She said, well, that looks a little better. I'll take both of them. <laughs> I'll take them both. And he's in big trouble. The Jewish authorities would be in big trouble. Why? Because they're going to die in their sins, and they cannot come to Christ and be saved if it's too late. Verse number 35. Then it said, Then said the Jews among themselves, Whether will he go, that we shall find him, Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? I mean, the Jews cannot believe that Jesus is going to be gone. They can't understand this. They can't even understand that he's not going to just go outside their boundaries and preach to the Gentiles. He's going to be gone all the way back to heaven and he's going to lock heaven's gate to those that will not come to Christ. And so they say in verse number 36, What manner of saying is this? He said... Ye shall seek me, ye shall not find me. And whether I am, thither ye cannot come. Well, they should have got the point by now. He told them, they're puzzled at this claim, and he has already given them the invitation to come to him. But they look at it from the natural point of view, as if Jesus is just going to go somewhere and hide on the earth. And the whole time, Jesus is going to be in heaven. And they could have made it to heaven themselves if they would have received the Messiah. But the Lord may be speaking to you today. Don't put it off another day. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Thank God there will never be a better day to get saved than today. Amen. If you've never been saved, I invite you. Come to Christ. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. He'll make you a brand new person in Jesus Christ. Amen. Then number three, the water of life. He says if you will come and drink of his water, you'll have the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in you doing the works of God. What we do in our flesh is nothing, but what we do with the power of God is everything. And so we have the Holy Spirit 
who comes to live in every believer. Notice in verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now he shouts out another message on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would carry two times the water and, and you know, put water everywhere on that last day. And so he uses the water as a symbolic language of trusting him as your Lord and Savior. He's still preaching and teaching in the temple at the end of the week. They have not approached him and tried to stop him. Why is that? Because he had much work to do. So Jesus has given another illustration. What does it mean when it says you need to drink of Christ to be saved? Well, he's shouting that message out as loud as he can. And he is saying with, with all the earnestness and all the compassion he can muster up, he says, please come to me while you have this opportunity. A few came, most of them sadly did not come. So his words to come to me to drink are alluded to the theme of many passages of his life giving blessings and promising to give the Holy Spirit to everybody who believes in Christ. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. He lives inside of you. Thank God the Holy Spirit stays with you. He doesn't come upon you and leave. He stays with you all the time. Verse number 38. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. I mean, the person who is saved, they're going to produce an abundance of good works because they believe on Christ and he allows the Holy Spirit to indwell the body of the believer. He told them, he said, you're going to look for me, but I'm going to be gone, but I'm going to send you a comforter. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. He will abide with you. So in verse 39, but this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Passage here tells us what the rivers of living water really are. The rivers of living water are works that we do in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. They're refreshing water. They help people to know Christ. They help others and encourage them. When you give a word for Jesus, you're putting some fresh water out there for a thirsty soul to drink. Amen. Thank God for that. So the Holy Spirit has been around since the beginning. He resides inside of every believer. We're sealed until the day of redemption or the day that we go to heaven, the Bible said. Amen. The Bible said that he was there in the beginning and the epic of the Spirit, he would indwell the people of God he would empower the people of God. He would energize the people of God. And he came down on the day of Pentecost and filled them. And there was a big, mighty wind. They went out and they told everybody about Jesus Christ. Yes. Why did they do that? Said they turned the whole town upside down. <laughs> Woo! Glory to God. How, how in the world can they turn the whole town upside down? i tell you how they did it. They did it through the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. You're not witnessing by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit inside of you. He witnesses as you witness to somebody else. So he says in verse number 40, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Talking about the prophet that comes. Moses had made a prediction that there's going to come a prophet one day. And they're saying this is that prophet. They're getting close, but they're not close enough yet when they just say he's a prophet. He's more than a prophet. He's a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man at the same time. Right. He came the first time as a prophet from God. He'll come the second time as the king that rules over the world. Amen. Thank God he'll come. He'll never crucify him again. Amen. So it says in verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Some people believe in him as their Lord while others are still hung up on his background from Nazareth and the northern part of Galilee. Mm -hmm. Now this shows the ignorance of the people. They should have known if they're going to reject him, they need to find out where he's from. And when they did some checking on it, they would find out that Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem and that little baby fulfilled the promise that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of the Messiah. Verse 42, Hath not the scripture said, Christ cometh from the seed of David, and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was? 
I mean, he's making it straight to them now. He's telling them right out front. The scripture tells you that when Christ comes, he comes out of Bethlehem. And you're still saying, I was born in Nazareth. I grew up in Nazareth, but I was born in Bethlehem, he says. And they're writing their proclamation. Jesus fit the qualifications. He was born in Bethlehem, just as Michael 5, 2 stated. The wise men told wicked King Herod that when Messiah come, he would be born in Bethlehem. They should have known that and investigated it, but they did not do it, and in so doing, they sealed their doom. They would not get saved. Verse 43. So there's a division among the people because of him. Here comes a split in the congregation. Some said he was the Messiah. Others said he could have never been the Messiah. Some thought they knew every detail about his upcoming uh, upbringing, but they didn't know that he was born in Bethlehem, so they really didn't know a whole lot of anything. Then it said in verse 44, some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. That's, that's remarkable. Here's some big soldiers. They go to arrest him, and they don't touch him. Friends, some of these unbelievers wanted to arrest Jesus and kill him, but it was not the proper time. No man laid hands on him. It's going to come six months later. Many of them said, I don't know what kind of story this is, but never man spake like this man spoke to us. Yes, I heard about a dropout. He was a dropout from school. And there was a man named Bobby. He, uh, he was a super genius. And uh, he sat down beside the dropout, and he told him, he said, I'm going to have to strike up a deal with you. And he said, uh, well, that's fine. What do you want? The dropout said. And the genius said, I'll ask you a question. If you don't know the answer, you have to give me $5. Then you can ask me a question. And if I don't know the answer, I'll give you $50. All right, said the dropout. And the genius goes first. And he says, what's the Pythagorean theory? And the dropout said, I don't know what in the world that is. He said, give me my $5. And he gave his $5. He said, now it's time for you to ask me a question. And so the dropout said, what has three legs going up a hill and four legs coming down a hill? And the genius thinks real hard and finally gives up. Hands the man 50 bucks. He said, well, what's the answer? And the dropout said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know the answer. So you owe me $50, huh? Friends, i tell you one thing we can know for sure. We can know for sure we're going to heaven because we've trusted Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory to God. We're not going to be stuck on this earth for all eternity. We're going to heaven. Amen. Verse number 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees. They said unto them, Why have you not brought him? I mean, the Pharisees asked the Roman officers why they had not arrested Jesus. He's standing right there preaching. And they are all listening to him. But the no arrest has been made. Why is that the case? Well, the next verse tells us. Verse 46, the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. I mean, nobody ever spoke like Jesus, friends. He had the most beautiful, powerful words anybody who's ever lived, and he spoke those words of truth. Verse 47, then answered them of the Pharisees, Well, are you deceived also? You're big soldiers. Do you believe in him? I mean, their rulers are saying, None of us has believed in him. And you telling me that you believe in him? He says here in this passage in verse 49, But this people who knoweth not the law, they're cursed. There was one of the rulers that believed in him. His name was Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is the one that objected to having a trial at night. He said, You cannot have a trial without having a, let a man tell his situation. You can't just automatically execute a man without having a fair trial and it has to be during the daytime all their trials were were not according to the law because they tried him after dark and that was forbidden by the Jewish law so Nicodemus the Bible says in verse 50 asked him he said unto them doth not doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he does I mean, he's one of the rulers and he come to Jesus in John chapter 3 and got saved and now he's standing up for Jesus. He's taking up for him. He's telling them, according to the law, he has to have a proper trial. They answered and said unto him in verse 52, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look.
For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Now they rebuke Nicodemus. And they say, Jesus is a false Messiah. And Nicodemus, you don't know what you're talking about because no prophet has ever come out of Galilee. And the real ignorance was not Nicodemus. It was those Pharisees. They didn't understand it, but there were several that had come out of Galilee. And so we know for sure that Nahum came out of Galilee. Jonah came out of Galilee. Jesus was brought up in Galilee, but he was born in Bethlehem. And so he says in verse 53, Every man went unto his own house. After this, Jesus finished his message. No man invited him home with him. Isn't that sad? He went out to the Mount of Olives. As far as we know, he spent the night, and he never spent a night inside of Jerusalem. And nobody ever invited him to come on this night. He stayed all night in the Mount of Olives. How about you, friends? Do you ask Jesus to come and live in your house? If you do, he'll come. If you'll open the door of your heart, he'll come. The choice is yours to make. Jesus has promised he will save everyone that calls upon his name for salvation. But he also warned that all those that reject him, they're going to be kept out of heaven forever. Our eternal destiny hangs on what we did with Jesus. One day... And see him as he is. Bow to him now, and he'll be your savior. But if you wait to the future, you'll be bowing to him as your judge. It'll be too late. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe today you'd say, Preacher, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know this one you talked about today. If that be the case, you can know him. You can call upon him. He knows you. And he died with you on his mind and in his heart. All you have to do is trust him. If you'd like to ask Christ to be your Savior in your heart, would you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. Fill me with your Spirit, Lord. And forgive me of all my sins. Make me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you made that decision, you asked the Lord to be your Savior. You made the best decision you could ever make. I just want to pray for you. Anyone like that, if you have invited Christ to be your Savior, would you just look up for a moment? I know you, by you looking up, you made that decision. God bless you. Thank you for that. Amen. Yes. Anybody else? You made the right decision. Maybe you'd say, Preacher, I know the Lord. I'm so glad I'm saved. But I want to serve Him even more. I've got a need or a burden on my heart. I've just got a prayer need. Be my prayer partner. Pray with me. I'd be glad. If anyone like that, you'd slip a hand up. Hands are lifted all around the congregation. Father, you've seen our hands, you know our hearts. Bless each one that raised a hand for whatever need that they may be uh, under, burdened under this morning. And Lord, we pray for the ones that looked up for salvation. Let them know they made the best decision that they ever made to trust Christ. And I pray you'll be with them in a wonderful way. That they'll have the joy bells ringing in their hearts. That only Jesus can give, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand on our feet while heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Rich can play something softly here and while he does. If you'd like to come down around the altar, pray. You feel free now. Maybe you want to come if you've been saved and make that public. We'll announce the good news for you. Maybe you want to come and join here at Grace, whatever the Lord leads you to do. Maybe you just want to come and pray for someone who's having a rough time. That's called being an intercessory prayer warrior. You come. Whatever the Lord leads you to do. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Christians are praying. Just as I am, without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come.
Well, if you're glad you got to save your life, Jesus, let's give him a big amen. Ready? Amen. amen. Thank God we have made the right decision when we come to Christ. We'll never have to worry about going to hell. We'll never have to worry about death. Why is that? Absent from the body is just to be present with the Lord. Amen. Thank you. We won't mess a breath. Just right amen. here and then right there. Just like amen. that. Let's be dismissed in prayer at this time. Brother Randy, you dismiss us if you will. Lord God in heaven, I thank you, Father, for this opportunity and how to worship the Lord. Hey. Pray, Lord God, now that you might help us to take this message with us, Father. Just remember that those here love us and we love them. Father, I know that others need to hear that message. Lord, you need to get that message out as often as you can. Yeah, yeah. Jesus Christ loves everybody and wants everybody, yeah. all of you, for all of you. Yeah. Father, I pray.
sort of hit me when all of a sudden they decided to bring back uh, school uniforms. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Okay, good morning. We're going to get rolling here quick. I'm going to try my first. Okay, we're in Luke chapter 11 today. Jesus had a little problem. Some people he's chasing around, chasing him, like Pastor thought about this morning, that he couldn't get away from. And they didn't want to get away from him because he was telling too much truth, and they wanted to disprove it. Never did work. Never did work. Any way they looked at it. Uh, Jesus was adamant he was going to get the message out. He always did. He always will. Now, we're going to uh, start with uh, Luke chapter 11. Uh, can I have somebody read? We're just going to start out reading it by groups. Uh, chapter 11, 37 through 41. Somebody want to read that? I can read it. Okay. Uh, but all it was was like uh, 
from what I understand, if you go to uh, uh, Chuck E. Cheese or something. Yeah, Chuck E. Cheese or some place like that, you know, or some of these uh, different slot places, that kind of thing, they've got that kind of stuff. So that's where it comes from, and they're going to kind of start off like that price point. They mark dollar point. It's not worth dollars, it's not worth a thing, but that's what the mark got. So a lot of times that's what happens. Contemporary money has undergone development to limit counterfeiters in its efforts to prevent some counterfeiting, but not all. I left you something to think about last week about coins that have a neural, what we call you would call a neural on the outside of the coin. Anybody ever find out why it's got that? Uh, one more thing. The sound never would have been in the scene. Why no, that's a good guess. Pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, half dollars, and silver dollars. Right now, pennies, the government's trying to get rid of them. They can't. To get rid of pennies, the price is going to go up on everything. Yeah. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Okay, so pennies are actually costing the government and nickels as far as that goes. They're costing the government more money to make than they're worth. Okay, so it costs money. Like one and three quarter cents to make a penny, and the nickels are up to like six cents to make a nickel. Okay. Now, if you look at it, you'll have to pass that around to make sure everybody can take a look at it. I got a tape on it, and I took it off. Anyway. Oh, this is for lunch. There you go. The pennies, the nickels are smooth all the way around. Okay. When you get into dimes, you get into uh, quarters. Half dollars, silver dollars, they all have a mural all the way around them. The reason they do that is because back in the day when most of the coinage, uh, there was very few bills, okay, bills are typically a large uh, uh, denomination. What they would do is they would take those because they're made of a particular type of material that you cannot duplicate. What they would do is on those coins, somehow or another, they would scrape the outside of the Coin. Okay, they were all smooth back then. Scrape the side of the coin to get some of that.